Welcome to The Rot Focus, a podcast for rotters, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Rotters Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, grab a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therockfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. Mentors, four types of wiser eyes. Yoda, Q, Nanny McPhee, Spock, Gandalf, Jarvis, Dumbledore, Mary Poppins, Merlin. Mentors. A mentor is the wise elder who teaches, provides gifts, motivates, and plants seeds. When serving as the hero's conscience, like Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio, the mentor keeps the protagonist out of the shadows. We often think of mentors as wizened old people who give the protagonist vital information as the quest begins. Mentors are wise, mysterious, a little deranged, and incredibly awe-inspiring. They can become much loved when they recur in a series, even as they create challenges or pose riddles that the hero or heroine must understand. Clarissa Piccola Estes in Women Who Run With Wolves says, In mythos and in fairy tale, Deities and other great spirits test the hearts of humans by showing up in various forms that disguise their divinity. They show up in robes, rags, silver sashes, and muddy feet. Gandalf entices Frodo. Dumbledore guides Harry from his entrance to Hogwarts onto his remaking at the series' end, another entrance with an exit. The mentor is a teacher imposing challenges, mental and physical. To fall short is to face destruction at the critical moment, as Luke left Yoda too soon and was saved only by luck from certain destruction. However, mentors can be dark, decoys that lure the protagonist into danger. And mentors can give the wrong advice, as Lady Russell gave the wrong advice to Anne Elliot in Persuasion by Jane Austen. Lady Russell clearly wants the best for Anne, but also clearly does not understand who is best for Anne. Protagonists can choose the wrong mentors, as Pip chooses Miss Havisham rather than Joe in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. And mentors can have flaws, as Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet gives wild advice, depends on others when he should not, and allows fear to overcome him when Juliet refuses to leave Romeo's dead body. Beginnings. The first mentor was named Mentor. The old steward who meets and guides Telemachus in Odyssey is the goddess Athena in disguise. Athena is appropriately associated with mentors. She is the goddess of wisdom, as the Greeks cunningly separated wisdom from learning and education. As goddess of battle, she oversees skilled fighting, which requires training and discipline, as opposed to the blind and violent chaos of Ares's war. The goddess of natural crafts, like weaving and carpentry, masonry and the like, Athena shows how to turn something close to its original form into a new and better purpose. Athena epitomizes the role of the mentor and her sacred obligation to aid heroes on their quest. Perseus had several mentors. The earliest hero in Greek myth is Perseus, a stripling who never thought things through before he jumped, which is the typical teenager. When he volunteers to bring back the head of the Gorgon Medusa, he doesn't even know where to look. First, he visits the Dodona, which had an early paleo diet. They eat ground acorns for their flour. They send him to the Grayi, the monstrous gray women. A trap if I ever saw one. He doesn't. 
The gray women have swan necks, are winged, and share one eye among them. To see past, present, and future, or to see here, there, and everywhere. That's never explained. These three gray women send him to the nymphs of the north. The Hyperporeans. Is that the early Norse mythology invading the Greek mythology? Is that another trap? Were the early Norse dominated by matriarchal society? Are the nymphs of the north early Valkyries? They could have easily killed Perseus. Instead, impressed by his adventurous spirit, they give him the very things he needs to fly to the Gorgon's Islands in order to take Medusa's head. Winged sandals, a cap of darkness, and a wallet that will hold anything. Oh, and they give him the location of the Gorgons. Why does Hollywood consistently ruin a perfectly good story every time they do the Perseus myth? So here's Perseus with three mentors. The Dodona for guidance, the Grey for a dangerous obstacle that he had to escape before they trapped and ate him, and the Hyperboreans, another dangerous obstacle that becomes a gift giver. And each one is part of the wider nexus of mentors. We have four functions of the mentor. The first is well known, to teach and to guide. A mentor will give information freely, but they may also withhold vital information. Worse, the mentor can provide advice, only to have it ignored. This is not Luke and Yoda of Star Wars. Luke was inept and pig-headed, but he tried. It is Arthur and Merlin. Merlin warned. Arthur said, I don't care. I want Guinevere and the alliance that she brings, and thus began years of problems. Second function of the mentor is as gift giver. Gods and mentors are sacred and saving in their gifts. Through these gifts, the protagonists prove their worth. They should be appropriately respectful of the quality of the gifts received, even when they don't quite understand the worth of the gift. As the god intercepted Odysseus and gave him Moli to defend against Circe, other mentors give actual gifts, special devices like Q in the James Bond stories, or special insights like Yoda in Star Wars. Nanny McPhee gives the best gifts, for they are emotionally and intellectually transforming. She says, when you need me but don't want me, I must stay. When you want me but don't need me, I must go. The boy cries, we will never want you. And she calmly replies, then I must stay. And at the end of the film, when she leaves, we all cry. Third function of the mentor as a nexus. A central point in a network. The nexus points the protagonist to the next stage or person. A mentor gathers information and people from many different points and pivots the information back to the protagonist. Dumbledore in the Harry Potter series gathers in from many points. No matter who he enlists, he receives information and loyalty from them, which he uses to send out more threads, weaving a metaphorical great cloth of knowledge that will shield and armor Harry. Gandalf in Lord of the Rings is also a nexus even as he often works alone. He has copious connections and taps into them constantly. He crosses all ethnic groups in Tolkien's stories, the elves and dwarves, hobbits and men. He is not afraid to venture into the dark, yet he can also be blinded and become captive of the dark when he is unwary. Fourth function of the mentor is as an obstacle. The challengers of the protagonist complacency Mentors propel the protagonist into the quest, ready or not. Often, mentors must break the protagonist's rock-hard hubris. The protagonist must learn to look into the far distance, between the east of where he or she is and the west of where he or she needs to be. Good and bad. Mentors are both. Nowhere is the duality of the mentor more clearly represented 
than with the mentor as obstacle. The mentor may be a healer, shaman, yet also a danger. Both bright and dark, he may deliberately lead the protagonist astray. Whether independent or allied, the well-intentioned mentor is the most dangerous. This is Lady Russell and Jane Austen's persuasion. In Austen's Emma, we have a protagonist who wants to be a mentor, yet she completely misunderstands the world and the situations around her. The comic mentor of Donkey and Shrek clearly understands the darkness of the world as he urges Shrek to think of the world as parfait, not onion, and nice boulder. Only Donkey can withstand and transform the fire of the dragon. An unexpected mentor is Katsumoto in The Last Samurai. In following the Samurai Code, he teaches the character played by Tom Cruise to appreciate the honor of battle when the fighting is for a cause that benefits all rather than greed or power. Sacred and mysterious are fallen and scarred, a core member of a community or an isolated hermit struggling on his own path are already enlightened. The mentor must slowly develop any connection with the protagonist. Trust is at the heart of that connection. Before calling on Frodo for the great quest with the ring, Gandalf brought fireworks for several years to the Shire. Frodo came to look forward to his visits and touched briefly the mystery that so enthralled him. When Gandalf sends him on the great quest, Frodo is still in love with the idea of mystery and still trusts that Gandalf is a great wizard who can defeat all enemies. Trust is the basis of the connection in the flawed book Aragon with the character of Brom, and successfully with Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. Then we have such mentors as a crazy woman under a ledge. I have a special place in my heart for the 13th Warrior, a seriously flawed adaptation of Michael Crichton's Eaters of the Dead. To explain my reasons would take days. The mentor is one of the few things that I like about the novel. The protagonist and his allies need to find the lair of the protagonist, so they consult the crazy woman under the ledge. We need your wisdom, the queen says to her. Were we following the archetypal story pattern, the crazy woman would be out of place. However, she's not the only mentor in the story. The most important one is Herger, who appears at the appropriate archetypal spot. The crazy woman's appearance in the story comes right before the great battle, the ordeal in the archetypal story pattern. Like Frigga, Odin's wife, the crazy woman understands the mysterious, yet she cannot speak it plainly. If at all, her wisdom is a riddle. Seek them in the earth, find them under the earth. Fogged by rational, established thinking, the fighters have no clue what she is saying. Here, Michael Crichton turns clever. For the character Ibn, who has needed so much instruction from Harger, especially about deception, he becomes mentor to the group, for he is the first to understand the crazy woman's wisdom. Under the earth means the lair is a cave. The riddle becomes clear. Stories can have more than one mentor, as we see in The Eaters of the Dead, transformed into film in The Thirteenth Warrior. I count three, perhaps four, maybe even more mentors in that film. Never limit story. Just keep it bounded. Mentors improve plots, and they can destroy them. Carefully consider the role that your mentors will perform in your story. They are not mere walk-ons. Mentors will test the readiness of the protagonist, teach necessary knowledge, guide toward the perspective needed for the quest, and give gifts, tangible and intangible. Choose your mentors wisely. Alice in Wonderland. Alice laughs when she say, There's no use trying. One can't believe impossible things. And the queen replies, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was younger, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast.
The Right Focus is currently in the series all about characters, from building and presenting a character to relationships, leadership styles, team roles, and special touches for characters. Avoid creating characters who are stereotypes. Reveal their public and private interiors. Focus on couples, mentors, enemies, and much, much more. The information comes from M.A. Lee's guidebook, Discovering Characters, part of the Discovering series on the writing craft. Link to the guidebooks are in the show notes. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by M.A. Lee from Writers, Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at linkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps, and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.